My slides are going to look a little bit different than y'all's, and that's fine, and we'll be okay with it. And I'm going to post them later, so we'll really be okay, <laughs> okay with it. Y'all's are way more detailed as far as background info, okay? Um, but if you were to take this and the cases and slide them into what you have, they match up as we go through, okay? And I'll tell you when we need to switch back and forth. So we're going to talk about children with respiratory disorders, chronic, acute, and that kind of fun stuff. So first off, looking at pediatric respiratory differences. So when we're talking about children, you know, pretty much everything's smaller, right? They're smaller nasopharynx. It's easily occluded during infection. Their um, tongue is relatively large in relationship to their oral cavity. So if there's any swelling, it's very easily occluded. Their epiglottis is very long and floppy, um, prone to swelling, vulnerable. Their lymph tissue grows rapidly in childhood. About the time, this is where we're talking about their tonsils and their adenoids. So when you've got a lot of um, swelling and things like that, that can cause obstruction. It generally atrophies after age 12. This is why you see a lot of kids getting their tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies prior to that. Their thyroid, cricoid, and tracheal cartilages are immature. Okay, so that means they're very easily, they collapse. They're very flexible and prone to collapse. Fewer muscles are functional along their airway, so they're less able to compensate. When you look at the position of things in their airway, their larynx and glottis is higher in the airway, increasing the risk of aspiration. Their chest wall is more pliable, and their chest is relatively round at birth. When you look at babies, they kind of got that um, barrel chest looking until they grow till about two. Their ribs are more horizontal and their abdominal breathers, okay? When you look at school-age kids, girls about between five and seven years of age switch to a more thoracic breathing pattern and boys kind of switch to both, kind of abdominal thoracic. This is why when we're talking about looking at young school-age children and under, if you're having trouble counting their respiratory rate and you're looking up here, you may want to look their side or at their tummy. Their diaphragm's more horizontal. And they've got all those large amounts of soft tissue along the airway, okay? So we know with kids, they breathe faster, right? We think so, right? The ones we've seen? Why? Anybody? They've got a smaller, so not necessarily smaller lungs, but their airway is smaller. So if you're trying to breathe through a straw, it's more resistance, right? So they're having to breathe at a faster rate because of the increased resistance. So they already have that decreased, increased resistance, decreased chest excursion. They're breathing at a faster respiratory rate. So then we've got our baseline high rate. And so then when there's stress or there's respiratory infection, their rate's going to go higher. Okay. Um, because they rely on that diaphragmatic abdominal breathing and their ribs are more horizontal, as they start crying and things like that and start sucking that air in the stomach, it pushes up against that and can cause respiratory distress. Okay. So just kind of a quick review when we're talking about respiratory emergencies and the difference. Okay, so respiratory distress, they've got that increased work of breathing, but they're still having adequate gas exchange. They're able to compensate. Okay. Respiratory failure, they're unable to maintain that oxygenation. So that's where you see them start to decompensate and have issues. And then respiratory arrest, they are no longer compensating that they are not breathing, which is a very bad thing. We don't want to get to that point, do we? So what are we going to do when our kids are respiratory stress? Yes. Yeah, they may be breathing a little faster. Here, we'll go back. They're going to be, say they're breathing a little faster. You've got a little bit of nasal flaring and things like that, but they haven't started to show cyanosis. They haven't started to show, um, so we've got color changes. Their satur oxygen saturations have gone down, haven't gone and dropped yet. They haven't had enough CO2 buildup to start causing those other issues. Okay. Whereas with failure, that's when you're going to start to see them decompensate. Okay. Until they just totally aren't able to breathe. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So with these kids, what we want to do is we want to support whatever compensatory mechanism that they're trying to do. Okay, so a lot of time you may see them in a tripod position, lean forward, chin jutting out to kind of help open that airway. If they're doing that, you're going to leave them in that position. You're not going to have them lay down. If they are sitting in their parent's lap and they're comfortable there and they're able to maintain their airway, you're going to leave them there because it's going to scare the crud out of them if you jerk them out of mom's lap and put them in the bed. And they'll start screeching and crying and that's going to further cause decompensation and can cause airway obstruction. We can elevate the head of the bed. I know you all saw that in some of the respiratory assessment videos we looked at. So elevate the head of the bed. You may want to put a neck roll behind them or a towel behind their neck. You can also, as we talked about, if you had to, you can jaw thrust. Whatever sources of stress, you want to minimize them. If we're talking about young kids and they don't know us, we're going to try to minimize, the, cluster our care so we're not going in every five minutes um, and causing them to get all worked up again and get upset. They need their rest. And then we're going to suction as needed. You can either use a yonker, which is going to be harder, versus a neosucker. And it's a, I don't have one with me right now. But it's very soft and pliable and bendable, soft rubber. And that you can suck their nose and mouth out with that. You're going to use humidified oxygen. Why would you use humidified O2? So it doesn't dry them out, right? So if we're already talking about inflammation and irritation, we don't want to make that worse and cause further inflammation and swelling. And then if they've, like we said, if they've been crying, if they've been working really hard to breathe, trying to gulp in air for a while, they may have some abdominal distension that's pushing on their diaphragm, making it harder to breathe. You may need to drop a nasogastric tube to help release that abdominal distension. Okay. So just realize with we were talking about with previously with adults and kids, you know, adults will kind of decompensate in a stair step. Kids will sit there and work and work and work and work and then they'll crunk on you. Okay, they will drop and decompensate. So just realize with kids, respiratory stress can quickly progress to respiratory failure. So here's just a picture of a kiddo in a tripod position. You can see the head of the bed is already elevated, but then they've got some additional where they're pushing their shoulders forward, they're jutting their chin out. They've got their mouth wide open. So if you're looking at this kiddo, you notice there, what do you see about him? He's kind of got a glazed look. His eyes are wide open. He's jutting his chin out a little bit. His mouth is open. He's pale. What about this one? You see the nasal flaring. You see his mouth's open a little wider. So if we go back. It looks a little bit like he's starting to decompensate. He's not able to hold it open as well. He's looking a little, his LOC changes, possibly a little tired. Versus this one, lots of trouble. Okay. So you kind of see the difference progressing from moderate through severe to respiratory failure. You want to kind of start practicing looking at things like that so when you kind of walk in a room and you do that doorway assessment, you can say your kid's in trouble or they're okay and you can go on with what you need to do or whether you need to get help right then. So one of the things when you're assessing kids, if they're having increased work of breathing and they're having retractions, you want to note where the retractions are. So we describe them by their location. They can be super sternal or super clavicular, which is up here. A lot of times you'll see that with upper airway obstructions versus your intercostal substernals, lower airway a lot of the time. So it kind of gives you an idea of where the issue is. And then they can also have the subcostals and substernals. Okay. You want to note whether they're mild, moderate, or severe, and if they change as throughout your assessment. And as y'all saw in that video, you may have to get a different angle to see how bad the retractions are, like from this way, looking at the head of the bed versus looking sideways on. With kids, unless they have an underlying cardiac condition or something else going on like that, the most common pathway to arrest in children, cardiopulmonary arrest, is respiratory failure. Different reasons, upper low and lower airway obstruction, so status asthmaticus, uh, pneumonia, upper airway, choking, aspiration, anaphylaxis, croup, 
those kind of things. Inadequate respiratory effort. What do you think would cause inadequate respiratory effort? Hmm? Somebody said so? Okay, so that would be more like our upper, that'd be more like one of our upper or lower obstructions. Some type of medication. So if our seizure kid, we've given them their seizure meds and they're sedated. Our um, post-operative kid who's had anesthesia, okay, something that might cause that. Some type of pulmonary abnormality. So if these kids have tracheomalacia or something like that where they have some type of malformation that's congenital in their airway. Kids with different types of muscular dystrophies, as I'll talk about later on when you get to neuromusculoskeletal. But um, one of the things with muscular dystrophies, you're talking about your diaphragm's a muscle, you're talking about your heart's muscle, all of those types of things make it harder to breathe. These kids, after a while, get a neuromuscular scoliosis, and you don't just have that S-shaped curve, but you also have the rotation with their spine. As it rotates, your ribs collapse kind of on your lungs and decrease the space they have to expand. It's the reason a lot of times they do scoliosis surgeries on these kids that are wheelchair bound and thing like that so they can breathe. It's always a good thing. Um, but those type of abnormalities can make it harder. As we progress to respiratory failure, if we're not able to intervene and ma manage that and maintain their airway, they may have to be intubated or trached and mechanically ventilated. But we want to catch it before that. So red flags to look for. Early signs with anything with kids, their parent will tell you they're not acting like themselves. Okay, So you may have kids with some type of underlying syndrome or disorder and things like that, and it's very hard to tell because they can't communicate with you. So it's always important if a parent's there to communicate with them as well, is this normal for them? Like I said, with tracheomalacia and things like that, those kids can be looking at you and have strider at rest. Okay, But is that normal for them? Are they in distress overall? So they're restless, they're irritable, like something's not right. But they may not be able to tell you they feel like something's not right. Tachypnea and tachycardia, so their respiratory rate's gonna go up, their heart rate's gonna go up. As they start breathing faster and faster, if their respiratory rate's greater than 60, they're at risk for apnea, secondary to that buildup of CO2 and that increased work of breathing. They're going to move into then that increased effort and those other alternative signs you're going to see. You're going to see retractions. Where are they? Are they mild, moderate, severe? Are they having nasal flaring? Head bobbing. So babies, they'll head bob as they're trying to breathe to help them. Grunting. Grunting is actually a late, going into a late sign as you start to progress. The child is actually trying to peep themselves like they're <laughs> trying to push that air out and push that CO2 out. As you start to see that, they'll have their respiratory rate and heart rate up, then you'll start to see that respiratory rate drop. They are not getting better, and you'll see those irregular patterns, okay? So if they go up and they're breathing at a rate of 60 and all of a sudden they're at 14, that's not good if their normal is 30, okay? Then you may have periods of apnea, um, you may have some other irregular patterns that you're looking at, like Kussmaul's respirations, things like that with DKA. Diminished breath sounds. So you always want to look at, are they able to clear their airway? Can they cough? If I've got somebody that can cough, they at least have an open airway. Okay. If they're striderous and can't get air in and out, that's a problem because they can't even get in, air down. Then when you're looking at asthmatics and things like that in the smaller airways in the bronchioles uh, with RSV and things like that, bronchiolitis, those start to get clogged up with mucus, they start to shut down, they start to close, the air may not move as well through there. So you always want to make sure you're listening all the way through. You're listening to the front, the sides, especially the middle, and you're listening to the back so you can hear those bases. Okay. They may get so tight and so where they're clamped down that they're not moving air. As they start to work and work and work and work to breathe, they're going to start to get drowsy. You may see LOC changes. Uh, they may start to be cyanotic. You want to look at their underlying skin color because they may not look blue. Okay, They may look ashy. They may look gray. They may just become very pale. You may have to look at their mucous membranes to kind of see that. As this continues to go on, they may start to have periods of apnea and then bradycardia. Okay, So bradycardia is a late sign. Questions? 
questions on that? So the quieter they are, the greater cause for concern. We want them to be able to talk to us. If you've got somebody that's having an asthma attack and they can only talk to you in short, I can't breathe. You know, if they can only talk to you in broken or short sentences, they're worse off than somebody that can sit there and have a conversation with you. Okay. If you have raised the head of the bed and not intervened and this kid was audibly wheezing when you left the room and striderous and then all of a sudden you don't hear them and you walk in and they can't make vocal sounds, they don't have an airway, that's a problem. Okay. So if any of these other signs occur, you want to make sure you have help immediately. If they're unable to swallow, if you start to notice an acute onset of drooling, that means they may have a supraglottic or epiglottic obstruction, so they cannot swallow um, if they're unable to talk to you or if you're noticing further increasing respiratory distress. So different types of oxygen delivery methods, kind of a review on this. One of the things you will see with kids occasionally, depending on where you are, a lot of times it's post-op, is they're still a little sleepy from anesthesia and they want to just give them a little bump of something until they wake up. So they take a piece that's kind of corrugated tubing, it's got tubing hooked into it and it's hooked into the humidified auction in the wall and it's just kind of in their face blowing. It's unreliable as to the actual percentage or liters that you're delivering. Uh, especially if the kid's sitting there turning its head and you're oxygenating their ear or their eyeball, that kind of stuff. Um, but you will see it occasionally with kids and have the parents kind of help hold it if they're having trouble maintaining their sats or if they're dropping a little until they wake up. Nasal cannula. So we can deliver anywhere from a quarter of a liter to about six liters, four to six liters. Anything over five, if you're delivering it via nasal cannula, needs to be heated and humidified. Okay, so we're not further irritating those airways and that's gonna be your OptiFlow. You're gonna see that used a lot with bronchiolitis. It's pretty much the primary one that you see it a lot with. Then you've got your simple face mask from six to 10 liters. Your non rebreather mask, you've got your Venturi mask, which you can dial a flow in between that anywhere from about up to about 40%, 45%, it depends on the manufacturer and the type. Then you've got your non-rebreather mask. So with your non-rebreather mask, we're gonna say it's 100%, but you know, one size mask does not always fit all. And unless they're perfectly molded to that kid, it's not delivering 100%. They're generally about say 95 to 98, depending on it. Some will say when you look at the literature, it delivers reliably anywhere from 60 to 90%. So but we'll call it, that's going to be the highest that we're going to give as far as oxygen and the best we can do without other types of manual intervention. Okay. Unless they're, you know they're an underlying cardiac kid or somebody that has some type of COPD, it does not hurt to slap 100% oxygen on them. For a short period of time, it doesn't hurt to slap 100% oxygen on anybody. So if they're truly in respiratory distress or if they're in shock and showing signs of respiratory distress because they're compensating with shock, are, is two liters gonna help them? Is increasing that two to four gonna help them? Okay, we wanna go up higher, all right. If they're unable to maintain their airway, then you can try to do manual ventilation with a bag valve mask. How are we gonna know if it's the right size You want to have the right size bag, so do we need an infant, peds, or adult? And then how do we know the right size mask? Mm -hmm. Bridge of their nose to their chin. Okay, and you want to make sure it has a good fit. How are we going to know if our ventilations are effective? Their chest rise, you're going to look at their chest. Because if we look at their sats, what are sats looking at? What is it measuring? Circulation, perfused oxygen. So if they're in shock and they're not perfusing well, those sats aren't going to be necessarily accurate, depending on where you're measuring them. If they're really cold and not perfusing their periphery and it's on their finger, it's not going to be accurate. One of the things we can do is kind of a step up if they start to have issues is you can try to put them on BiPAP or CPAP. Kids with some type of chronic neuromuscular, like we were talking about muscular dystrophies and things like that, or obstructive sleep apneas, um, or somebody with a really severe tonsil issues, tonsils, adenoids that needs a tonsillectomy and things like that at night that has apnea, 
You can put them on BiPAP or CPAP and it just helps keep that airway open as they're breathing. They will do it a lot on those kids, especially after surgery with anesthesia. And then you've got our highest level of intervention with our intubation and ventilation. And we went over like some of the pictures we talked about in assessment, so we're just gonna go ahead and start on our otitis media case. And like I said, if you want to write on the case, fine. If you want to do it later and you just want to sit back and listen now, that's fine too. So Helen's a 10-month-old girl. She lives with her parents and her two siblings. Her mom just went back to work because of financial reasons. So Helen and her two-year-old brother and three-year-old sister are now in daycare while mom and dad work. They were all breastfed and they were weaned to the bottle around seven months of age. And Helen is currently bottle fed. Their family lives in a middle-class neighborhood and dad has been a heavy smoker for the past 10 years. Last week, Helen had an upper respiratory infection after being exposed to a child who was sick at daycare. How often does that happen? All the time, because parents have to work. So what do we do? We medicate them with Tylenol and Motrin, and they send them to school. And then they get sick, and everybody gets sick. And schools have to close lately because <laughs> everybody's get sick. And heaven forbid they close, because then they have to forfeit the football game that's on Friday. One of the schools in East Texas had to do that this last couple of weeks. So five days later, Helen was seen in the pediatrician's office for a temp of 38.3, so just under 101.5. She was fussy, she had a decreased appetite and was pulling on her right ear and crying. That's a very common sign you'll see with babies and toddlers, especially if they can't communicate with you, if they're rubbing their ear on things or if they're pulling on their ears. To let you know to look at their ears, um, her right tympanic membrane is bulging red and opaque with a small amount of purulent drainage. Does that look like a happy eardrum? Doesn't look very good. So looking at risk factors, what risk factors does Helen have for developing acute otitis media? Dad's a smoker. What else? Bottle feeding. So you want to know how are they bottle feeding? What's her daily feeding patterns? Do they hand her a bottle and let her lay down in bed and prop it? Because then they're laying down and their eustachian tubes are nice and horizontal and things build up in them. Okay, what else? Daycare attendants, lots of germy, germy munchkins. I have two, so I can say that. She also had a history of a prior upper respiratory infection, so she's already at risk. Immature immune system. We're looking at the characteristics of the eustachian tube. They're short, relatively horizontal, easily collapsible. Secondhand smoke exposure from dad. We talked about daycare attendance and bottle propane. So what's the relationship between Helen's recent enrollment in daycare and her condition? Jeremy's a snotty kid, she's exposed to a lot of things. Um, you've got increased exposure to other kids. They're in very close contact. We're talking, y'all. some of y'all were at Head Start this past week, right? How many runny noses did you see? Everywhere it was pouring, right? It was ridiculous, and you wanted to go home and like take the hottest shower you could and decontaminate. Very close contact. They're hugging. Killer kids love to hug each other and touch each other, and they're doing this and they're touching the toys. And no matter how often they clean, there's still cross contamination. And then we've got that immature immune system. So as far as the upper respiratory, the relationship between upper respiratory infection and the development of otitis media, we already talked about her already being at risk. And this is why when we're talking about 80% of infections with kids are respiratory related. They've already got that immature eustachian tubes, which is prone to easily collapse. When we have anything that's stasis, we've got fluid buildup, it's sitting there, it likes to grow things. So you've got that negative pressure causes the eustachian tubes to collapse, and then you can get that bacteria growth. So how does passive smoke increase the risk for otitis media? You may want to take a guess. Mm -hmm. Irritates the airways, irritates the eustachian tubes. 
irritates that lining in the ear and causes an inflammatory response. Y'all tell me when you're ready for me to go to the next one. You ready? No? Everybody breathe. We'll do our yoga while we're in here. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. So what is the primary treatment for acute otitis media? And it differs by their age. So I heard amoxicillin. Okay. So first off, if they're under six months of age, they will go ahead and treat them. It's hard to tell, you got little ears, they may have had it going on and brewing for longer because they can't really communicate with you and tell you what's going on. They're also worried about prolonged infection causing hearing loss. So if they're under six months of age, they will automatically do antibiotics. Now, when we look at over six months of age, we'll talk about deferring treatment for 24 to 72 hours and that's the recommendation because a lot of otitis media will resolve spontaneously. However, most of the time, by the time you go to the doctor, they're like, how long has this been going on? It's been going on five to seven days. They've been running a fever. They had a URI. Or they may say, well, here, if it doesn't start getting better in the next 24 hours, go ahead and start the antibiotics. What do parents do regardless? They go fill the antibiotics and give it to them. They want to treat their kid. So a lot of them will resolve. But just in case, they will give oral antibiotics. Amoxicillin is the first line. They'll talk about antibiotic overuse. Amoxicillin is the one that is overused pretty much the most. So it's not as effective a lot of times. Um, then they may progress to augmentin, which is a penicillin combo as the second line if that doesn't work. Some kids will have to have then like a cephalosporin if it, does, if it doesn't clear up, if, depending on what's associated with it, or rocephin. Um, they want to manage the pain, so they can give them eardrops for pain. A lot of times they don't use antibiotic type drops, they use eardrops, the pain eardrops. Hmm? The pain drops? Depends on where you go. <laughs> but primarily then they want you to treat the fever with the antipyretic. So, if they continue to have issues, repeated recurrent infections, multiple ones, they may consider a myringotomy and tympanostomy. In simple terms, they're going to put tubes in their ears. That's going to keep that eustachian tube from collapsing. The issue is then it's open all the time. So then you have a secondary set of, you know, fun things that can happen. The reason they do that is with chronic recurrent infections, they're worried about conductive hearing loss over time. All right, for those of y'all that have med lab today, this is practice. For those of y'all that have had it, this is PTSD. No. Okay. So Helen was placed on amoxicillin for 10 days. On the ninth day, mom brings her back in with symptoms similar to what she had, her initial presentation. So now they want to put her on augmentin. They're going to give her 400 milligrams twice a day, and she weighs about 20 pounds. So what's the safe dose of augmentin for her weight if it's 90 mg per kilo per day? And 19.8 pounds is about 9 kilos. Eight hundred and ten for the daily. So how much per dose? About four or five. And so that's a good one to talk about because we get 405 and so what is this it's just shy of that and that's okay okay it's okay if it's a little under we always want to make sure it's therapeutic 
it's not unsafe to give a low dose necessarily, but it may not be therapeutic, so it may cause them to build up with that. So it may not work as well. So you always want to double check, especially if it's low. But that one's okay. A lot of times we have standard dosing. So if it goes over by 5 milligrams or 25 or something like that, they may say, okay, we're going to give a standard dose of 400 milligrams. Okay. And if you're ever confused about that, you can always ask the pharmacy and say, I notice this is a little bit different. Is this just y'all standard dose that y'all give? Or if we're drawing up oral meds, for that five milligrams, it may require you to go into another unit dose cup, and then you have to toss it. And so they may say, okay, 400 milligrams, we're gonna see if that's effective. All right, y'all can go back. We can talk about tonsillitis. Any questions about otitis media? So this is going to be on your slides. I keep looking at you, Michelle. Are you making faces at me? So we've got our tonsillitis. It's inflammation of the tonsils. The most common cause um, of tonsillitis is strep. Strep can be a very bad thing. Um, Y'all heard of acute glomerulonephritis? Mm -hmm. Can cause that. Can cause all kinds of fun cardiac stuff. You can tell them what it causes in cardiac? Rheumatic fever, yeah. So we always want to treat strep. Sometimes people will be like, oh, it's just strep throat. <coughs> And let's throw some amoxicillin at it. And as we know, amoxicillin is overused. So they can end up with like a subclinical strep infection that then flares up a couple weeks later and have to have something else. My son had to have like two months worth of treatment one time for strep. Amoxicillin, Augmentin, Omnicef, and then we had to do Rocephin shots. So you do want to make sure it's treated. So most common cause is strep. Symptoms, they're gonna have enlarged swollen tonsils, depending on, they'll have a sore throat, difficulty swallowing. Depending on how severe the inflammation is, you may have difficulty breathing. They're gonna treat them with the antibiotics that we talked about, so penicillins and or cephalosporins, and then other supportive care. You can, they can give them ice, they can give them um, soft foods, liquids, antipyretics with fever. If they have, I think it's more than three, three episodes within a year, they will consider a tonsillectomy and or tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and take out their adenoids as well. The big thing y'all need to know is when we're talking about post-op care because we want to observe for complications. Okay. So we want to look for bleeding. So right fresh post-op, do we expect them to have bright red blood? Yes. Do we expect them to show up with bright red blood a week later? No, that would mean something's wrong. We want to get them checked out that they may have, you know, pulled a stitch or they're having some issue. So one clue you can look for and watch, are they frequently swallowing because that blood's trickling down the back of their throat? So they're swallowing more often. We don't want to give them any red jello, purple Kool-Aid, things like that. That's going to make it harder to determine if we have active bleeding. And we don't want to use any straws. Why would we not want to use straws? Yeah, just like dental surgery, you don't want to use anything with negative pressure, so it'll mess with their clots. It'll mess with clotting. They can, will use frequently ice collars and things like that post-op. Okay, we're going to go back to your cases. We're going to talk about croup. So what they call croup, they actually have a set of croup kind of syndromes. And we'll talk about what we consider traditional croup versus kind of what falls under this umbrella. So croup syndromes, they can be any things that cause upper airway obstruction, basically. They can be viral or bacterial. Acute spasmodic laryngitis, they, you can see they talk about and they're described by where they are in the airway. 
versus acute laryngotracheobronchitis, or LTB, which is a lot easier to say. So acute spasmodic laryngitis, or acute LTB, is viral, and then acute tracheitis and epiglottitis is bacterial, primarily. The reason they fall under this umbrella is because all can present clinically with the manifestations of that upper airway obstruction. With any type of croup syndrome, you want to assess the severity. Is it mild, moderate, severe, or are we worried about impending respiratory failure? Okay, so they have that occasional, if you've ever heard croup, how many of y'all have heard somebody with croup? Okay, a couple of you. So they've got that barky cough, that seal bark cough. With mild, you're not going to see strider at rest. Maybe if they're running around playing, you might, but they shouldn't have strider at rest or you won't see retractions. With moderate, they're going to have a more frequent barky cough and audible strider at rest. With severe, frequent barky cough, you're going to have that prominent strider, that <gasps> kind of sound. To kipnea, the respiratory rate is going to go up, and they're going to have that marked chest wall of track. Can't even talk. Chest wall retractions with that agitation and distress. Okay. And then as they work and work and work to breathe, their retractions may look like they're getting better, but they're actually not moving enough air, so they're getting that increased fatigue. Okay. <coughs> See little baby with croup. He's pulling right here. And he's got some substernal. He's got, he's one of those no neck babies. <laughs> That's like this. So just a little bit of nasal flaring. But that strider is very prominent. Baby's like, leave me alone. You see he's got some substernal and subcostal retractions. It's already elevated head and shoulders on a pillow. Still having some audible strider. If we don't close that, he's going to keep having strider on it. All right. So that's what strider sounds like. So our first case, we're going to talk about what's considered traditional croup or acute LTB. So if we say croup, that's kind of what we're talking about. So we're going to talk about Mary. Mary's two years old. Mom tells you she developed a strange cough and a crowing noise when she breathes in. She's had a mild fever and a runny nose during the day. When she cries, the noise during inspiration gets worse, and so mom got really worried and brought her into the local emergency room. What's the crowing sound during inspiration called? Strider. strider. What is the most likely cause of strider? upper airway obstruction, be it choking, be it, you know, croup, it's airway constriction. With this kid, because of her history, the URI, the fever, that kind of stuff, we worry about croup. 
What other signs are common with this condition? Barky cough. These are the kids that have that seal bark cough. And then some of y'all were answering this. So what signs would we worry about? If our kid starts to have a barky cough and then they're having strider, what other signs would suggest that the strider and the respiratory distress is becoming worse? Retractions, increased work of breathing, increased respiratory rate, followed by if it starts to decrease, decrease LOC and cyanosis, which is a late sign. What is the main treatment for severe strider? It's not something you give a lot for anything else. Do y'all know? Hmm? They can try albuterol. It's not going to help here, though. It's going to help with your lower airway obstructions. Um, it's racemic epinephrine, but you are right, and it is nebulized. Okay, it's an aerosolized medication. You give it a nebulizer. It is... It's not when we're talking about IM, epi, and things like that. No, this is specifically for upper airway obstruction. Okay, this is going to focus on the airway. It's not going to be systemic. It is more of a, it's a sympathiometic, it's a bronchodilator. And it helps relax those airways, similar to albuterol. Okay. Now, we only give this for Strider. If our kid has croup and they're sitting there happy with a barky cough in mom's lap and their SATs are 96 and they're stable, we're not going to give that kid Strider. I mean, not Strider, <laughs> racemic epinephrine. I can't talk. If the kid doesn't have Strider, we're not going to give him racemic epinephrine. One of the things we got to worry about, this is not something you're going to send them home with a prescription for and let them give it home. You're going to monitor this kid because they're already in severe respiratory distress for us to have to give it in the first place. Okay? One of the things they talk about is a rebound effect, per se. It, they can progress back to their pre regress to their pretreatment state. Okay. So if they came in in really severe strider, you want to watch them for a couple hours before you send them home because they may need more than one treatment. We're going to do, do other things if they get that severe to have on board, but that's going to be the main treatment to get that airway open. other interventions that we're going to consider with croup after we give them our racemic epi or if they don't have strider that we're going to do. Humidified oxygen, so cool, either cool mist or heated humidified. So if they're at home, what are some things they can do? They can go in the bathroom, shut the door, turn the shower on hot and let that steam build up in the bathroom. I know it's not cold right here right now because we live in Texas, but if it's cold and it's icy outside and you have that nice cold air, you can actually take them outside in that cool air. This is why sometimes when you take these kids to the ER and you've had them in the car and you don't turn the heat on because it's going to make it worse because it's dry, and they ride in that cold car to the ER, they're like, what's wrong with them? They don't sound that bad. And you're like, just wait till we get home. Yeah. And because they've been working all day to breathe, so they're tired at night, and then they've been working all day on top of that. So they can also open the freezer and stick their head kind of in the freezer, too, and get that cool. So we've got, they're going to give them steroids. Decadron is considered to be the steroid of choice with croup, more so than prednisolone, prednisone, or a pred, you know, that kind of thing. Even if it's IM, IV, or PO, they want to give them decadron. You don't want to give this for more than a couple days. If you do, you're going to have to wean them off of it. It's a pretty potent steroid. Keep them hydrated if they can drink. Like we talked about, cool mist and humidified oxygen. If they are breathing at a respiratory rate of higher than 60, you don't want them trying to drink. Okay. They're at risk for aspiration. It's like walking and chewing gum. You don't want to do that. Other diagnoses we should consider with the sudden onset of strider in a well child. They swallowed something. 
Okay, so upper obstruction from aspiration or possibly if they have some underlying history or not, but if they're suddenly becoming sick after being exposed to something or eating something, you want to worry about anaphylaxis. I know these are sideways. You can kind of hear that barky cough just a little bit, but what he's getting is racemic epinephrine. I want you to look at his eyes. But you can tell his eyes are wide. He doesn't look real happy. He doesn't look like he's feeling good. Now look at his color now. He's very pale in his face, especially around his mouth. He's had racemic epinephrine. He feels like he can breathe again. That is Action Hank. That is not a baby ball, just so you know. Dad calls it Action Hank. Now, but they had to give him a steroid shot. <laughs> but you hear that, <gasps> while he's crying. So if you sit there and say, I'm going to start an IV on this kid because they can't breathe, and they start doing this, because <gasps> they need fluids, yeah, we need to make sure they have an airway first. I won't make y'all listen to him scream because I'm a mean mom. <laughs> you know, this is like the umpteenth time he had had croup. So he started having this fun about four years old. So ah, we don't want to do that. through the rest of the upper airway stuff and I'll let y'all take a break. All right, so we're talking about epiglottitis. So this is the one where we're talking about primarily bacterial in nature. They may have a low grade fever with LTB, with croup, but this is where we're talking about a sudden onset of high fever. Okay. So Jessica's five years old. Mom brings her to the ER with a sudden onset of respiratory stridor on inspiration and she's got a temp of 1025, which is also 39.2. She's drooling and prefers to sit forward with her chin slightly protruded. Her mom states that she developed difficulty breathing so suddenly, and both mom and child appear anxious. These are the kids that come in. They look like they're getting a URI. They lay down, take a nap because they feel bad. They wake up with a sky-high fever and strider. Okay. They will generally treat them and check them for epiglottitis. So they may still have an LTB that's just gotten a little out of control, but they will go ahead and give these kids antibiotics. Okay. This is an old picture. You can see her in that tripod position. We don't see epiglottitis a lot anymore. Um, this, she's in respiratory strider. They're drilling in a tripod position. And then our kid has a temp of 39.2. So those are all of the things that are concerning in addition to the sudden onset of fever and respiratory distress. Are we talking about the upper or the lower airway here? Talking about an upper airway problem. Got that strider and that upper airway obstruction. So what actions are initial interventions gonna include with this kid? So we're talking about anti-inflammatory. What else? Before we do anything, yeah, oxygen. What if she? What if we go near her and she starts screeching? That's not good, right? Because we're talking about way up in the airway here, and it's really swollen. And if they're drooling, that means they can't swallow very well. We may need to intubate you. This is the kid that you want to make sure there's a trach tray in the room and an intubation tray. Okay, before you start manipulating them. You're going to tiptoe quietly. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure they're okay and that they have an airway. If they are in a position, we're not going to. These are the kids. If they're going to do an x-ray on this kid, as y'all look at your notes, you'll see sometimes they can have a, what's called a thumb sign. 
versus like our steeple sign with the croup. They'll have like a thumb sign. It's because they've done an x-ray from the side and that's how their epiglottis is swollen. Okay. You wouldn't send them off to x-ray. You wouldn't send them anywhere without somebody having eyeballs on them. Okay, and you're going to call somebody in there immediately for help. And we're going to let them be in whatever position they are holding their airway open in. We're not going to put an IV in them right now. We're not going to stimulate them. You're not going to do anything to them until someone is ready to establish an airway if they lose it. If it's August and July and you've got brand new residents and they're coming in and they're like, oh, let's do a throat culture on this kid, you're going to be like, oh, hell to the no. Okay, you're going to go in front of that kid and go, no, you're not doing this. If there's any concern about them losing that airway because there is that much swelling, you're not going to manipulate that airway at all, okay? So when we talk about is obtaining a throat culture indicated, no, 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 and no. It can cause tracheal, tracheal and laryngospasm and further obstruction, okay? What are some other interventions we can implement to maintain a patent airway in this kid? Y'all talked about oxygen. If they're calm enough, or if mom's sitting right there and they'll let mom hold oxygen to their face, that's fine, okay? As long as it's not causing them further distress. But our primary goal is maintaining that airway. So we can put a face mask on them or hold it to their face as long as they're okay with that. You need to be prepared to bag them if needed and have that at the bedside until the doctor's ready to intubate. Um, if they can't get a tube in and intubate them, they may have to trach them. After or during while the airway is being established, you're going to do IV hydration and antibiotics. This kid's going to need about a week of IV antibiotics in hospital, seven to ten days, and then they'll go home on oral antibiotics. Why are we giving all these kids fluid with respiratory distress? They're working to breathe, they're diaphoretic, they're insensible fluid loss. Okay, good. So we talked about that we didn't see epiglottitis very much anymore. It's because of the vaccine we give. What vaccine is it? Do you know? It's the HIB vaccine. HIB, HIB. The Haemophilus influenza type B, or HIB, which is easier prevents all some, some, some types of meningitis, some pneumonia, but the primarily reason they give it, it, permits, it prevents epiglottitis. So that's why it's important when you have kids coming in that present with croup and some type of upper airway obstruction, you wanna check their vaccination history and make sure they've been immunized and that they're on track. So just Briefly, we're going to go over an anaphylaxis to kind of talk about the difference with some of that, and then I'll let y'all take a break. So a 12-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department after being stung by a bee. He had been well until he was stung on his right forearm while playing in the yard. He initially complained of localized pain and swelling, but 15 minutes later, he began to say he was short of breath. His parents also observed him to be wheezing. He said he felt very weak, and so his parents brought him immediately to the local ER. So he's 12, so what about those vitals bother us? His heart rate's high, respiratory rate's high, blood pressure's low, okay? So we kind of look at the, when we're look, talking about pediatric advanced life support guidelines and things like that, PALS, PAIRS, um, generally if they're under 10, it's 70 plus two times their age in years is what you want for their top number, okay, for their systolic. So that's low for a 12 year old. He's in mild respiratory distress, he's drowsy and pale, and he awakens when you talk to him. He's got generalized urticaria. He has no conjunctival edema, but his, and his lips and tongue are not swollen. His voice sounds normal. He's tacky, but he doesn't have any murmurs. His lung shows mild wheezing, and he's aerating fine with minimal retractions. Abdomen soft, on tender fine. His face moderately pale, and the bee sinks side on his right forearm is unremarkable. They don't see any foreign bodies still in the wound. Why is that important to check that? Because if they've still got something in there, they're going to still be reacting to it. We need to stop the reaction, okay? So this is an IgE-mediated reaction. 
So which of these exam findings are most concerning with him? He's drowsy, he's pale, he's wheezing and progressing respiratory distress. What are the things would we want to know about him? Think about some of the stuff we talked about on assessment day. What are we petting? The C's, we're petting the C's. So what else, would, what do we know already? What did they tell us already? Color, he's pale. Does he have any edema? Eyes aren't swollen, face isn't swollen, lips and mouth isn't swollen, might be a little bit at the sting site. Temperature was what? 37.1. We also want to know how his skin temp feels. Okay, what else? What's not on there? What do we not know? Cap refill and what else? The quality of his pulses. Are they there? What are the peripheral compared to the central? That kind of stuff. It's going to tell us about his perfusion. Because what are we worried about with anaphylaxis in addition to the respiratory distress? Shock. Okay. So what findings, I don't know why it's out of order, would indicate that the patient's condition's worsening? Further decrease in LOC, respiratory distress, stridor. He starts to develop upper, more upper airway swelling and obstruction. If you start to see swelling of his tongue, mouth, lips, if his cap refill becomes prolonged, if the time becomes prolonged, and if the blood pressure starts to drop worse. Now, if he's already got a lower blood pressure, remember blood pressure is the last thing to go. So if his blood pressure is already low, he's already showing some early, we're progressing into shock, okay? So based on those thoughts, what actions do we think are indicated based on this, at this time with this kid? Epinephrine, okay, what kind of epinephrine? Not racemic. I am epi. If y'all haven't ever played with one of these, you can come play with an on break. So um, I am epinephrine, either an EpiPen or an EpiPen Junior, depending on the size and weight of the kid, the doses are based on it. That's the first line. We're going to try to maintain the airway, so raise the head of the bed, position of comfort, if we need to jaw thrust, put oxygen on them, bag them, whatever we need to do with that. At this point, he's maintaining his airway, so we just want to be prepared. IV fluids, so what's the best kind of IV fluids? What are we given for shock? We're gonna give it for any type of shock. Hmm, lactated ringers are normal saline, so some type of isotonic crystalloid. You'll see it written all three of those ways. We're gonna give 20 mils per kilo for a bolus. How fast are we gonna give it? Anybody know? Think about with most kids, they probably got a 20 to a 24 gauge IV. Are we gonna try to slam that in? You can try, it might blow their IV and then you might have to go get an intraosseous placed and that's not gonna be fun for any of them. Um, but yeah, 20 minutes, 15, you know, as fast as you can give it and keep your line. You're not gonna give it over an hour to two, okay? What's the most common type um, when we're talking about shock that you're going to see in respiratory distress? In most respiratory distress kids. Hypovolemic shock. Because they are having all of that insensible fluid loss because they're working to breathe. And they're not able to drink because they're trying to breathe. Okay. So you're going to see hypovolemic shock. You're especially going to see it in other types of conditions where you see respiratory distress. For example, DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. Those kids are having Kussmaul's respirations. They're blowing off a lot of CO2. They're doing all those things. So you're going to see hypovolemia in them as well. Okay. Anaphylaxis is a little bit different. 
so you're going to have anaphylactic or distributive shock. Anybody know the difference? Okay. So when we're talking about, let's talk about shocks. So you're talking about the pipes, right? So with hypovolemic, our pipes are the right size. We just don't have enough fluid. Okay. With anaphylaxis shock, you've got a massive systemic vasodilation of your pipes. So your fluid may have been fine, but you don't have enough to push through the pipes. Okay. That's why you're having to give fluid here. Okay. That epi, what's the epi going to do? Vasoconstrict. Okay. That's going to help. All right. Does that make sense? Very similar. You're just talking about the pipes. Other meds you're going to give secondary after that epi. Some type of steroid, methylprednisolone or solumedrol, IV. You're going to give them cimetidine and diphenhydramine. Why are we giving them antihistamines and tagamet? It's an IgE-mediated reaction. Those things are throughout your whole It's through your gut. Okay? Remember, your gut is a big part of this. So a lot of times you'll see them give cimetidine or Zantac or something like that to somebody that's having a contact dermatitis reaction along with Benadryl. It helps mediate their reaction. What discharge at home care instructions? Once we get this kid situated and settled and send them home, what, what do we need to check with on this family and what do we need to tell them about? We need to make sure, do they have an EpiPen? How much are EpiPens right now? A lot of money. How much are EpiPens, Michelle? $300 a pop. They did come out with a generic. CVS has come out with a generic where you can get a couple for about half the cost. However, not all of them have it. Mm hmm yeah, it makes it like 100, 100, it's less than 200, I know, for two, to, for two, where it was running three to 600 for one or two. And you need to leave one at the school, okay? So that's the deal, is it can't go back and forth with the kid. We know four, five, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, what are they, you know, who knows where it'll end up. One needs to be left at the school, so there needs to be a plan on file with the school what needs to be done in this. Just like if you've got a seizure kid that has a go bag that has their um, rectal volume, their diastat in it. Just like if you've got an asthmatic that you're having to leave an inhaler, they all need to have their medications with them. Um, used to, they wouldn't let asthmatics keep their inhalers with them. They had to go to the school nurse to get it. There is a law in Texas, they can keep these things with them. I'm sure there's plenty of things, but yeah, but because of the issues that happen, they're allowed to keep them with them. Yeah, don't let them tell you they, they can't. Yes, the EpiPens do expire. You, they don't want, you know, you've got to, mm hmm yep. Depends on how many you have, but they may need another dose is the issue, but you're going to call. If you have to give it, if you have to give her CMIC epinephrine, if you have to give it IM epinephrine, any of that, they need to go in and be seen. They need to go to the emergency room and go to the hospital. So even if they only have one, they're going to get them seen. Most of the time, you're not going to have more than one together, depending on where they are. So trigger management, if you know what they're allergic to, they need to be aware of that. Um, a lot of schools now, if you've got a kid allergic to peanuts, they have allergy-free classrooms or different types of things. Um, there is, they have done some official, more official recommendations recently with the management of peanut allergy and anaphylaxis that are kind of interesting. Um, I also have a friend that was a dietitian I worked with at Scottish Rite, and her daughter just underwent desensitization to peanuts in the last year. So she can now eat them. They're still watching that. Yeah, they still don't want you to give them a whole bunch of stuff with that. But, but yeah, they do have some things they can do to desensitize them if there's an issue. You may also want the kid to have a medic alert tag. So that if something were to happen, they would know what they were allergic to. 
questions about this one? All right, I'm gonna let y'all take a break. All right. So when we're talking about croup and things like that, that's primarily like para-influenza virus and things like that. When we're talking about viral croup, bronchiolitis is a little bit different. So here we've got a three-month-old male. He came in with copious nasal secretions. What's copious? A lot, running down their face, yeah, copious, that's a lot. Anytime you see copious, you wanna think bronchiolitis, RSV, that kind of stuff. So copious nasal secretions and a history of a fever for a few days. The infant's crying in mom's arms, and mom states the infant's been ab unable to eat for the past 12 hours. During your assessment, you note subcostal retractions, inspiratory and expiratory wheezing. Weight, about six kilos. Temperature, 37.9. Heart rate, 150. Respiratory rate, 52. Blood pressure, 110 over 70, and SATs of 93 on room air. They've tentatively diagnosed the patient with bronchiolitis. What's concerning about this? Okay, heart rate's high for a three-month-old, and respiratory rate's high. What else? He hasn't been able to eat for 12 hours, so what are we worried about there? We're worried about dehydration and hypovolemia. Okay, so what else would you want to know if he hasn't been eating? What's his urine output? Has he been peeing? Remember, that's the most accurate representation of hydration when we're talking about kids. Are they peeing? And diaper weights with babies. We're also worried about SATs, right? Remember when Ms. Trinka talked about, when we're talking about kids, they haven't been exposed to all the fun things we've been exposed to. They basically have a new set of parts, virgin lungs, things like that. Normal SATs on those kids should be 100, okay? What's the most likely organism that we see the most with bronchiolitis? RSV, you see fun TV commercials about it and everything, huh? So the respiratory syncytial virus, also RSV, which is much easier to say. It's a nasty, nasty thing. It can cause all kinds of um, other respiratory illnesses, pneumonia, things like that, but we see a lot of it with bronchiolitis, especially with babies. We can be running around with RSV and have a cold. Okay, what we think is a cold. Are we talking about upper or lower respiratory here? We're talking about lower, we're talking about the bronchioles. And then to help you figure out, we've got subcostal retractions and wheezing, which is our lower airways. What other symptoms might you expect this kiddo to exhibit? Three month old. Nasal flaring. Hmm. Could be grunting, depending on how severe it is. Keep trying to keep the airway open. Y'all talked about some of this already, a little bit about the urine output. So if our urine output was low, you know, we would, ex we would expect to see that with this, but that's not a good sign. Um, what else? So they could have an increased fever, but if they're, they're running a fever, but what, would, what part of their body would we expect to be cool? Their extremities would probably be cold because they're probably shifting because they're hypovolemic. Poor, possibly poor peripheral pulses. And then depending on how severe it is, LOC changes. So what nursing interventions are appropriate at this time for this kiddo? So we want to hydrate him. Now, if his rest, his rest period was at in the 50s, so okay, if they can drink. We want to orally, always use oral hydration if possible, if they're able to, if they're conscious enough and awake enough and can take it. Um, but like we said, if their rest period rate's greater than 60, we don't want to give them oral fluids or feeds. Doesn't mean we can't drop an NG tube or give them IV hydration, okay? What else? What about those copious nasal secretions? Is it gonna do any good if I slap a nasal cannula on this kid? No, because we're oxygenating snot. What do you gotta do? Suction, 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 suction. 
we can give them a nasal cannula after we suction them, or we can put them on a face mask. These kids are the ones, like we talked about, that end up a lot on heated and humidified oxygen, high flow oxygen or optiflow. They want to confirm that it's RSV, so they're going to have to send a sputum culture, which is going to be pretty easy to collect <laughs> if he's got that many secretions. And then we're going to place them on contact droplet isolation. Okay. Very, very, very contagious. We don't want to share it, especially with other babies. So we we'll reassess our kid and his temperature is now higher. It's 39. So it's over 101.5. What do we need to do? We're going to give him some type of antipyretic. Which one? Okay. How old is he? Three months. So can we give him ibuprofen? At what age can you give him ibuprofen? Six months or older. Okay. So acetaminophen, the dosage range is 10 to 15 mg per kilo. If you're going to end up, if you ever end up working with kids, that's just something to memorize and there's a fun fact. So we've got 5.9 kilos. This is weight. If it's 10 to 15 mg per kilo, what's our dosage range? Fifty nine to eighty eight point five milligrams. Okay, so depending on they can dose them depending on on that. What are we gonna include in discharge teaching with this parent? or in teaching while we're in the hospital, hand washing. Okay, what else? Yeah, we don't want to bring siblings up there and share. We, you know, if the parents can avoid trading out as much, that might help spread. What else? These kids may have a cough and nasal secretions and all this stuff for weeks, like three, two, three weeks after. So what are they going to do? How to section, okay? So they need to know how to bulb section the kid. The bulb section is their friend. They're just going to look like they're sucking their brains out through their nose, but they need to know how to section him. Because remember, this is, this is viral. Are we going to give antibiotics for this? No. Suction, hydrate, oxygen, suction, hydrate, oxygen, over and over and over. Okay. What else? How are we going to know that this mom knows how to use the bulb suction and how much Tylenol to give and all of these things? We're going to watch her. We're going to have her draw it up for us and show us. We're going to have a demo of the bulb suction, repeat demo. Okay, we're going to give her written instructions. If this is their new baby and they're three months old and mom's a first time mom and they're hysterical, are they going to understand what we're talking to the whole time in the hospital? No, we need to reinforce it frequently and give them written instructions. They need to know the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. When do we need to come back to the hospital? Okay, when do I need to go back and see my doctor? What to do about, you know, the next set of scheduled immunizations at four months, okay? You want to make sure they're drinking, and they need to know number of counting the wet diapers. They want to make sure they're having urine output. One of the biggest cause of med errors is home dosing and parents not understanding the right, correct amount of medication, okay? If you're going to tell them teaspoons, they need to know what they're measuring it with teaspoons. You can't send them home with a syringe that just says 1 to 10 mils and doesn't have 1 and 2 teaspoons on the back side of it, okay? They don't just get it. They'll get a spoon out and pour it in. You know, y'all just need to, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> That's one of the biggest errors and the biggest problems with medication dosing. Who is at greatest risk for severe illness with RSV? Younger children, immunocompromised, if they have an underlying condition like cardiac babies, uh, cystic fibrosis, things like that. Preemies, okay, if they're less than um, 32, 36, 35 weeks gestation. There is a medication, there is a vaccine for RSV, it's Synagis, S-Y-N-A-G-I-S. It's very expensive. 
um, thousand to two thousand a shot. They have to have them every month during RSV season. And if they're less than two years of age, when that RSV season rolls back around, they need another series. Okay, so if you've got a congenital heart baby, yeah, that can be very expensive. And depending on insurance, it doesn't always cover what it needs to on it. But that's why they don't just prophylactically give it to everybody, because it's very expensive. Huh? Skid, yeah, skids, so immunocompromised, yep. Synagis, S-Y-N-A-G-I-S, I think it's on y'all's, um, it may be on y'all's slides, your copy. So what's important to think about this, we also have to think about nursing management in the hospital, right? So if I'm going to assign you to this kid, I'm not going to assign you to the other new baby we're taking care of on the unit. Right? Or we're not going to, if we're helping manage patients and we're do, helping figure out who's going to go in our open bed on the congenital heart unit, we're not going to take the RSV baby. We're not going to float the NICU nurse over that's going to go back and forth and help us today because we're short staffed and put her in with the RSV baby. Okay? She's a generalist nurse. She can take care of anybody while she's here, but we're not going to run the risk of her carrying our SV back over there. Okay? Hmm. No, no, no. You just put it with some other infectious, and you would look at your risk factors on an older kid. You'd have clean side, dirty side. You'd pair them up with some other older, you know, someone that wouldn't be as effective. I've seen a two-year-old end up on, I put a two-year-old on ECMO when I worked in the ICU with RSV. Like it's bad with little kids. Okay, so we just don't want to share it. Okay, so yeah, you're taking care of multiple kids, but you're not gonna have all these other kids at risk that are at risk. You're not gonna pair them together in an assignment is the big deal. Okay. No, not gonna go on the hemonc floor, not gonna go on the congenital heart unit. If you're going floating to the oncology unit and you have a sniffle or a sneeze, you're not going to the oncology unit, okay? So just be aware of that. So the biggest thing is we gotta wash our hands, we gotta teach them how to properly wash their hands and for how long. Y'all will hear the happy birthday song in your head. Um, we've actually taught hand washing at Head Start several times, which is pretty funny because then the teacher is ready to kill us by the time we leave because the kids are singing whatever song we've taught them to sing for that long. And then they're like, well, we don't have time to do it. I don't have time to line up 20 kids to wash their hands in front of the sink every time they go to the bathroom, they go in and out to recess, they go to lunch, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, just be aware. If you are teaching them, they may not always be doing it, but you never know where they can pick up all kinds of fun. All right, questions on RSV? Asthma. Asthma or reactive airway disease. So, you know, what happens? We're clean. We don't have time to clean the house, right? But when we clean the house and it's all nice and dusty as it will be when you finally have time to clean it, um, you know, what happens? You stir the dust up and you start to sneeze or you start to cough, and that's your normal protective mechanism, right? So with asthma, these kids have an excessive reaction of the normal protective mechanism, right? Generally, they don't diagnose asthma unless it's truly, truly severe until they're about five years of age because kids under five years of age, they catch everything. That's 80% of respiratory infections. They have smaller airways. They're going to react to everything, okay? They truly want to watch and see what's going on. So with asthma, we have that bronchospasm added to the buildup of mucosal edema. You've got increased mucus and increased formation. So that all leads to airway obstruction. So what would normally happen to help with that? This is like that on steroids, okay? So with asthma, you have chronic um, and acute symptoms persistent symptoms and acute exacerbations. You want to manage the chronic inflammation because what's going to happen is it's going to cause airway remodeling. Okay? So the more poorly managed that you have, if you have somebody with a chronic respiratory condition that is non-compliant and it's not managed well, asthma, cystic fibrosis, any of that stuff, 
you're going to have that airway remodeling. Okay, so that's why we want to manage triggers and we want to manage exacerbations. With that airway remodeling, the mucosa will get thicker. You'll start to get that smooth muscle hypertrophy, so it'll be excessively reactive to everything. Okay, and then the mucus gland hypertrophy, so it's just going to get keep producing more and more and more mucus. Okay, so your airways are going to get hypersensitive. So we want to control those symptoms and prevent exacerbations. What is an acute exacerbation? It's what we traditionally call an asthma attack. They may cough, um, depending on when their cough is and how much. We'll talk about it in a minute. There's different levels of classifications with asthma. You'll see wheezing. You may have inspiratory, expiratory, or both inspiratory and expiratory wheezing. They'll be short of breath. They'll tell you they feel like something's it's sitting on my chest. I can't breathe. I feel like a weight's on my chest. Increased respiratory rate. You can see some nasal flaring, retractions. Depending on the severity of the asthma exacerbation, they may have decreased to no air movement. Okay, so in building up, it may cause hypoxia. Okay. So six-year-old Danielle comes into the community health clinic with her mom. She presents with a history of wheezing, shortness of breath, tells you her chest is tight, and she developed a cough last night. She's lethargic and pale, and her skin is cool and clammy. She's sitting in a tripod position, and her eyes are open wide, and she looks fearful. So if we kind of picture our, that kid we had earlier when we were talking about levels of distress and those wide eyes and tripod position. So we're thinking, well, she may be having an asthma exacerbation, and an asthma attack, what's going on? What historical data would help us to clarify that that's truly what it is? Does she have a history of asthma? Is there a family history of asthma? Does she, how many times has she had this type of symptoms? Is this a first time? Has she had multiple occurrences of this in the past year or in the past couple years? Has she had any other respiratory illness? Are we worried that she's got, you know, pneumonia or something else going on? Has she had an upper respiratory infection that's moved lower? Have we introduced any new triggers into the environment? Did they just get a new dog? cat, you know, um, did she just start doing cross country running through the trees, you know, that kind of stuff, has she been camping, that kind of thing, new things at home or school. Are we talking about upper or lower here? Lower airway. So we've got the wheezing and the chest tightness. Is she in, rest is Danielle in respiratory distress? She's lethargic, she's pale, cool and clammy, she's tripod, she's fearful. She's got the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, nasal flaring, retractions, poor chest expansion. You will also see with these kids a prolonged expiratory phase because they're trying to empty out those lower airways, get that CO2 out. Cool extremities, poor peripheral pulses, and LOC changes. What's going to be our initial intervention with her? So what are we going to do first? You're going to give her oxygen. You're going to make sure she's in a position to comfort. She's got her airway open. You're going to give her oxygen. Are we going to put a nasal cannula on her? No, we're going to put a face mask on her. We're going to let her, you know, see if we can elevate the head of the bed, if she feels comfortable leaning back against that, if she's comfortable tripoding. Where she's, she doesn't need to lie down. It's the big deal. Okay, so yes, then next we're going to give her a bronchodilator, and we'll talk more about those in a minute. But how are we going to know if the oxygen therapy and the bronchodilators are effective if they're helping relieve her respiratory problem? Hmm? Decreased work of breathing. So her increased work of breathing is going to improve, right? Her anxiety may go down. Her what? Her color is going to improve. What else? She may not be as her peak flow may improve, she may not be as diaphoretic, the wheezing may decrease or improve, what else? Her sats will go up. If she's already cool and clammy, we may have to, you know, wait a little bit longer for that, but what else? I can breathe better. I don't feel like my chest is tight. She's going to be able to talk to you in more than short sentences. She's going to tell you that she feels better. Y'all talked about she'd be more alert. She'd feel calmer. Okay, good. I'll tell me when y'all are ready. I know y'all are writing. Okay. 
Who in here has asthma? Couple of you. Okay. This weather has not been our friend. <laughs> if you didn't know your nursing faculty were falling apart, you do now. All right. So with our asthma medications, we have two categories, rescuers and controllers. Okay. You always want to give the short-acting control rescuer first. Short-acting rescuer first. So our first line when we're looking at is our short-acting beta-2 agonist. So we're talking about our albuterol or our levalbuterol. Um, depending on the severity of the attack, they may give them something like terbutaline. And then they're going to give them, depending on the severity and what the level is, corticosteroids. And they may give them prednisolone, decadron, solumedrol. And then you'll have your anticholinergic, like your ipotropium bromide. Some medications, they'll mix albuterol and atrovent, which is your ipotropium. Okay. It's okay to mix those. We want to give our bronchodilator first if we're giving a bronchodilator and a steroid. Why? Because it's going to dilate and open up those airways so that steroid will get down in and work better. Why would we not just give them a steroid to help reduce inflammation? They're constricted, besides, is, which is going to work faster? Yeah, the bronchodilator. Steroids are going to take a while. They're going to help keep, they're going to help reduce the inflammation, but they're more primarily going to help keep it down as well. Okay. Some of these kids that have a severe or a higher level of asthma, and we're talking about classification and more severe asthma, they're going to also be on these controllers. Okay, so if I've got a kid that just has exercise induced asthma attacks, they just may have a beta 2 agonist. They just may have an albuterol inhaler, and they use it before PE, and they're good to go. Okay. Um, other kids that have more severe issues and multiple, you know, we live in Texas, multiple triggers with all of these fun things blowing around in the pollen, they may have controllers. So we have a long-acting beta-2 agonist, like salmeterol. They may use theophylline, um, steroids that they use with controllers, budesonide. So when we're talking about Advair, okay, that's got a long-acting and a corticosteroid in it, okay. Um, depending on what their different type of asthma is, they may have some type of allergy medication like Singular. A lot of them are on Zyrtec, that kind of stuff. So how are we going to give them their medication? It can come in different ways. We talked about the Advair. It's a dry powder inhaler. And they actually have a spot where they put their mouth on it and breathe in and out. It's really kind of gross. But <laughs> what are we worried about steroids when they're inhaling steroids? So that yeast infection, right? Or thrush. So what do we do to avoid that? They rinse their mouth out after they take it. Good. Then if they have a propellant inhaler, they always need to be using a spacer with their propellant inhaler. How many of y'all, if you've seen somebody take an inhaler, have ever seen them use a spacer with it? Never. And everybody should use one. It's not just a kid thing. It's an adult thing, too. <laughs> You should be using the spacer, and the reason is, is so you're actually getting the medication and you're not just spraying it into the back of your mouth, okay? It's actually going into your airway as you're breathing in and out, okay? So they attach the MDI into the spacer. They may have a mouthpiece or they may have a mask. The mask is really good with um, smaller kids because they can sit there and scream or anything else, and you just hold the mask up, and they're just breathing in and out, and they get their medication, okay? We don't care if people cry and scream when we're giving them nebulizers or when we're giving them <laughs> MDIs with a spacer because it just makes them gulp in air. So it just helps get it down further. If we talk about our aerosolized medications, albuterol, and those can also be given via nebulizer. And you can see that they can give it in line with oxygen as well or with a bag valve mask. This one has a mask on it. And then we have our whole set and pieces up there. Okay. You'll see this little clear kind of triangular piece sitting in here. Most of them all have something like that or like another little, you know, cylindrical piece, long piece that goes in there. Those have to be in there. It's what helps aerosolize the med. So as people take them apart and wash them and reuse them, if something doesn't work, just always double check that you have all your parts. You can either take it apart like this and put your med in, or if you're not as coordinated, you can also pour it in in the top there. 
That's just a kiddo getting his through his mask. So there's different levels of severity when we're talking about asthma. Okay, so mild intermittent means that they've only got a rescue med. They don't have controller meds. It doesn't interfere. Their asthma doesn't interfere with normal activity. So when we're talking about these classifications, it's all how affect their daily life and their activities of daily living. Okay, so my symptoms are less than twice a week. My nighttime symptoms are less than twice a month. Okay. Mild persistent, they're having more frequent symptoms at night and during the month. Causes minor limitation with their activity. And so these kids may need a rescue inhaler plus an anti-inflammatory controller. Okay. Versus when you're talking about moderate, persistent, and severe. With, mo with severe persistent, they're having continual symptoms. Um, they frequently have a cough at night or they wake up coughing in the morning, that kind of stuff extremely limits their normal activity. So they're gonna be needing multiple long-term control meds. They may need oral corticosteroids, that kind of stuff. Okay. They base this on whether they are less than or more than five years. The types of symptoms we talked about, are they symptoms at night or daily symptoms? The frequency of the exacerbations, how many times are we having to go in into the doctor? How many times are we having to use our albuterol inhaler? That kind of stuff. This is gonna guide their medication regimen and then we're looking at our whole big goal with all of this is management, okay? We wanna manage those exacerbations, so symptom control. Depending on the severity and the amount of exacerbations, they may review it every one to six months, okay? With this, we're gonna have our, it's gonna guide our asthma action plan and that's what you're gonna have on file at home and at the school on what you need to do. So the biggest goal with acute nursing care with that is to maintain the, we're talking about asthma management, so maintain the airway. We're gonna assess and reassess. So every time we intervene, we need to reassess and see what's going on. Humidified oxygen and NEBS. We talked about elevating the head of the bed and comfort measures. We need to maintain strict dyno on these kids because we wanna know if they're staying hydrated and push oral fluids. With all of these kids with respiratory and when y'all talk about cardiac and everything else, they work so hard to breathe and you wanna give them a break, okay? You wanna let them, their body heal and let them work. So you're gonna try to keep the room quiet. You're gonna group their nursing task with respiratory and cardiac kids. If you can give them choices, you know, do you wanna take this med or this med first, that's great. If I'm having to give them two inhalers and one's a steroid, you can't give them that choice. So what choice can you give them? I can give them a job. You can hold this, or you can help take the lids off, or you can help put the meds in there, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, bless you. Lots of teaching with asthma. It is a lifelong condition, okay? You don't outgrow asthma. It doesn't go away. You may get bigger, and so your airways don't react as much, or you may not be as exposed to those same triggers, okay? but you need to educate the parents about the disease process, the parents and the child, okay? As these kids get older with chronic illness, especially that's something very um, specific to peds and very um, unique to that is you've got these kids and they're going through different growth and developmental stages and ages and those kinds of things and you're working with them as they grow to become more independent, okay? So that's a big deal with teaching the child as well at their level and letting them grow with that because they're gonna end up being an adult. And some of these chronic conditions, like when we talk about cystic fibrosis and things like that, there are not adult doctors out there that care for those type of conditions. And so they have to be very, um, they have to be advocates for themselves and be ready to take care and manage their condition and know where to go and what to do. So what types of meds they have, the schedule, and how to administer them. Peak expiratory flow meetings, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Asthma, their asthma action plan, and then what other lifestyle modifications they need to do for trigger control and how to prevent those exacerbations. So peak expiratory flow. It's gonna measure your ability to push air out forcefully out of your lungs, okay? So you're, <sighs> okay? So they have to be standing up straight. If you've ever seen a respiratory therapist try to do a peak flow reading or a pulmonary function test and somebody's sitting down in a chair, that is not gonna get them the best reading, okay? They need to be standing up. They're gonna set, make sure the meter's set to zero. They're gonna take, take a deep breath, make sure their lips are fully closed around the mouthpiece and blow out hard and fast. So you can tell them it's like blowing candles out on a birthday cake or it's like a dragon breathing fire, okay? But you're not trying to it's not gentle, it's not like blowing a kiss. You wanna record the highest of three tries. 
their base peak expiratory flow reading or their peak flow reading is going to be when they're feeling well. Okay. If this is the first time you've seen a kid, if they don't know what their base is and that type of stuff, there is a whole nice little set of algorithms that will come with your peak flow chart that will tell you based on this person's age, weight, height, yada, 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 this is what their normal peak flow should be. So they're going to do their best of three tries, and they should be measuring this on a daily basis two to three times a day. Okay. And they want to help track that so you can see how they're doing. What that's going to do is it's going to put them in a zone. Okay. So green zone is good control. It's greater than 80% of their personal best. So the best of three blows on that peak flow reading and that number that you took, greater than 80% of that, and they're having no symptoms, they're just going to take their usual meds. If all they have is a rescue inhaler, they don't take anything. If they're one of these with severe persistent asthma and they have multiple meds, they're going to take those as scheduled. Okay. Yellow zone is caution. So that's 50 to 80% of personal best. Okay, so they may have some symptoms present. They need to take that short-acting beta-2 agonist, that albuterol, and then they need to call their doctor. If they're in the red zone, that's where you're really worried. They're less than 50%. They've got symptoms. They need to take that short-acting beta-2 agonist, and they need to go see someone, be it the PCP at the office, be it the ER. They need to, somebody needs to lay eyes on them. This is one type of asthma action plan. There are many. They all look a little different. Some are colored, some are not. But it, this one's nice because it kind of gives them a, a good visual of what type of symptoms they might see and how they're associated with what. It also gives them a list of where they can check their triggers. Okay. Common triggers. The biggest trigger, actually, for asthma is cockroach excrement. Seriously, it's nasty. Um, when I worked at Scottish Rite, we had a group of kids. They had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And a lot of the times, it's a congenital um, deteriorating disease. And you all will hear more about it uh, when you all talk about neuromuscular. But basically, these kids, they don't have a very long life expectancy, OK, because their muscles just fail on them. And they generally die of heart failure or a secondary infection. Okay, they'll end up with pneumonia or some type of secondary infection because of their sedentary type lifestyle because of the condition. So a lot of time these kids have to be on that CPAP or BiPAP we talked about earlier. So we had two brothers um, come in for care coordination. They were two years apart. They both had DMD. They were teenagers. And they came in from home with their BiPAP and CPAP for care coordination. And they had cockroaches all in their BiPAP and CPAP and all in their wheelchairs. And you would have to flip the light on in the middle of the night and hear this before you walked in, which is really nasty. And that's very hard to deal with as a nurse when you're looking at, you're like, how can they live like that? How are these kids like that? Because they're literally breathing in the stuff that's in their machine. Okay. They actually had to hire someone the hospital did to go out and bug the bomb their home and, and deal with this. So that's just one of the, you know, kind of weird, you're like, this is not, this is not okay, you know. <laughs> but that's a big trigger with that. Uh, chemical fumes, if they're stripping floors, if there's kind of spray, um, hairsprays, perfumes, this is why we ask that you limit that stuff in the pediatric setting. It can actually cause somebody to go in a full-blown asthma attack. The pollen that is blowing around right now, um, weather changes stress. You can have kids get really stressed out right for the STAR test and have asthma attacks, okay? Um, if they get angry, depending on where you live. I didn't have asthma exacerbations as bad until after I lived in Galveston with the pollution in Houston. Okay. Things like that, smoke. A lot of times if you've got family that smokes, um, you're going to want to ask them to do it outside. If they have, it doesn't totally get rid of it, but if they have another jacket or shirt, they can wear on top of it and leave that outside and just wear it when they're there. Sometimes that helps. Okay. Um, they tell you you should, you know, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but. So this is another IgE mediated. 
problem. Um, this is how your allergen sensitivities work. This is the same thing where it causes anaphylaxis and all of those things. They inhale whatever the trigger or the allergen is. It goes in their airway. They get inflammation and obstruction. You have that IgE-mediated antibody reaction that releases the histamines and the eosinophils. Okay, so trigger management. This is where we are going. So we want to avoid exposure to tobacco smoke. You don't want them smoking in the car um, with the kid in the car. You want to re reduce the indoor humidity to less than 50%. Asthmatic kids do better in a drier climate, so you may need a dehumidifier. You want to wash the sheets, pillowcases, and comforters every one to two weeks in hot water. They want you to wash them greater than 130 degrees. Why is that a problem? With safety. What are we supposed to have the hot water heater set at? Less than 120. Okay. Um, vacuum carpets daily. Who does that? Will you please come to my house if you do that? <laughs> um, only my mother-in-law does that. It's like the twilight zone. She remodels my pantry daily. Um, so you can have them remove the carpet from the bedroom. That's just going to allow all these dust mites and things to build up. Okay. So if they can remove carpet from the bedroom and replace it with tile or flooring, if they're not able to do that with the rest of the house, if not, you want to make sure there's not pets at least out of their bedroom. I know a lot of people have family pets, we do as well, but you want to keep them out of the, whoever has asthma's bedroom, you want to keep them off their bed. Um, a lot of times you can get the pillow protectors and covers so that the dust mites and things that would be in mattresses and in your pillows, they'll help cover that. Um, you want to avoid going down on outside on the ozone action days, like the red and orange days, when mold and pollen counts and pollution levels are high. So pretty much that's going to be when you have a trigger, then you're going to use your rescue medication. With exercise-induced asthma, because they know that's what causes it, they're going to use it prior to the activity. We want kids to be active. I know it can be a deterrent a lot of the times if they're having exacerbations with it, so you want to find one that works with them and balance that activity. You want to make sure they're using their rescue med prior and ensure the parents, they can still participate in that and do that activity. What is a good type of exercise for kids with asthma or with cystic fibrosis? Swimming, why? <laughs> Controlled breathing, per slip breathing, yep, perfect. gymnastics since I was four or five and never had a problem like this. Now that fall is here and the weather is getting colder, I seem to be getting worse. I don't even know if I'll feel well enough to cheer the next game. My friends would be so upset with me if I missed it. You can't be hurt enough from practice. Oh yeah, as if this is a practice day. I'm not sleeping through the night anymore. I wake up coughing and I feel like I snore. What developmental stage are we in? Ooh, yeah. Um, but that's a pretty good representation of the types of stuff with exercise-induced asthma and with weather changes. That's pretty funny. So what is status asthmaticus? It's basically you continue to have uh, asthma exacerbations and severe respiratory distress despite supportive intervention. So just like with status epilepticus, they can continue to seize even after intervention. 
So we've put this kid on auction. We've given him back-to-back -back albuterol treatments. We may have him on continuous albuterol treatments. Okay, they're not improving. The big deal with this is they're going to work so long and then they're going to crash. So this can progress quickly to respiratory failure and death. So if your kid is continuing to have problems, if they need more than 40% oxygen, those kids are going to go up to the ICU to have their asthma managed. Okay, they may need to be put on terbutaline, they may need a magnesium drip, things like that. Um, depending on the severity, they may intubate them to allow their um, lungs to body to rest a little bit, and they're going to manage that as respiratory failure. Okay. Are y'all good? All right. So Chris is seven, and he was recently diagnosed with mild asthma. He wants to play on the soccer team, but his mom states she's afraid that all that running will cause him to have an asthma attack. How should the nurse respond? Exercise is good. We want him to be active. We want him to be healthy. We want him to exercise. But what can he do? He needs to have his inhaler with him. Let's try a pretreatment before soccer. Let's see if that helps. Okay. So Diana's five, and she has severe persistent asthma. She frequently has to have nebulizer treatments at home and school. She is non-compliant with the treatments and continually pulls the nebulizer mask off of her face and screams that she doesn't like that stupid mask. What interventions can the nurse implement? I'm going to whoop your butt. Yeah, no, that won't work. So could you decorate her mask? What else? Some type of distraction. Is there something she can play with? Can she put a puzzle together while it's on there? Is there something she can watch on TV? What behavioral-wise can we do with her? Explain why. Is a five-year-old going to care? Okay. So what do we do? It's not bribery. It's <laughs> positive reinforcement um, or collective bargaining, whatever you want to call it at the point. But... <laughs> A uh, stamp chart, sticker chart, you know, if you have, if you go all week without doing this, or if you go two days, or, or whatever, not how many stickers, if you get three stickers, you can watch the show, or you can go play with this toy, or pull something out of the sticker box, that kind of stuff. You want something that's consistent. If she's having to have it at home in school, you want something that can consistently be implemented across things, okay? Um, and it's very hard if they don't manage it at home and then you're trying to deal with it in the hospital or even in the school setting. So Jeff is 16. He comes in with moderate persistent asthma. He comes into the ER in respiratory distress after they went on a school field trip to the Nature Museum in the park. Upon further questioning, Jeff tells you that he hasn't been taking his controller meds and he refused to use his rescue inhaler in front of his friends because he didn't want, want him to think he's sick. How should the nurse respond and what interventions can the nurse implement? But he's not sick. He doesn't need it. He didn't want to be different. I know. Yeah, you're going to reinforce. You're still going to reinforce it, but that's, you know, I'm okay. So are there other kids that have asthma that you can introduce them to? Is there a support group? Um, you know, talk to them about are there certain times you can take your controller meds when you're not around other people? Can we look at our schedule? We're still going to have to take your rescue stuff, but can you go somewhere else and use it if that's an issue? Um, depending on the age of the kids, there's sometimes when you can intervene and work within the classroom or in the school. It's better with younger school age kids. Um, one of the behavioral things you can do with these edge kids is you can do a care contract with adolescents. Um, it puts them, it gives them control and it kind of empowers them and they sign a care contract and agree to the terms on how they're going to take their meds and what they're going to do. And it puts them in that adult piece and a lot of times it works really well. But it's just a care contract. <coughs> that answer? Okay, what other questions do y'all have? Okay. All right, 
We got cystic fibrosis left. Do y'all want to take a break before we do it, or y'all want to go? Okay. Stretch, breathe. All right. Okay, cystic fibrosis. It's an autosomal, autosomal recessive exocrine gland dysfunction. That is a t mouthful. What does autosomal recessive mean? You have to have two, so both parents have to have the gene, okay? So they can't say, mom can't say, oh, it's all dad's family's fault, or it's all mom's family's fault. No, you both did it. Um, but you'll have families do that because they don't understand, you know, what it is. Um, what's exocrine gland? What do exocrine glands do? They secrete. They excrete, right? So that is all of your mucus, sweat, all of that, anything that excretes something, okay? So with this, you have increased viscosity of mucus gland secretion, so very, very, very thick secretions, um, high sweat electrolytes, because they sweat, that's where they excrete, they're going to lose electrolytes. Because of all those thick mucus gland secretions, they end up with pancreatic insufficiency, your pancreas gets all clogged up with this thick, sticky mucus, and it causes them to end up a lot of times with pancreatic scarring and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, secondary stickia. There is no cure for this. It's unstoppable. Um, there's a lot of, it, like I said, it depends on compliance. Um, some have more severe cases than others, but compliance also with treatment regimen also affects a lot of their quality of life and length of life. Um, a lot of these kids come in multiple times a year for pulmonary treatments in the hospital. Okay. What? Okay. Well, it's just your low battery, but we're working. I do have another recording of this, so as y'all go through it, if, the, um, if something's weird with the volume, let me know and I'll post the other one too. Okay. Um, but depending on treatments and they come in, they can be more productive and less painful lives, and, but few do survive into their 30s. Most have to have a lung transplant within their lifetime. And it can prolong their life but it doesn't pre prevent the other damage and all of that. And most of the time, like a set of lungs is about 10 years max, I think. So it is sad. We, used, we have a little kid with, um, not a little kid anymore, with CF. Um, his name's Eduardo, but he missed so much school last year. He didn't get to come last semester or this semester, but he generally comes and picks up from CF. He's um, in like eighth grade now. He's been doing this since he was in like fourth grade. But his family, his brother, he has an older brother that's like in his 20s that doesn't have the disease. Um, or he's not a carrier either. Um, but he has the disease. And so they are from like Colombia or something like that. And they have to, to listen to mom. It's really interesting to listen to mom because when they go to travel, they carry all of the equipment that we're going to talk about and all the special clearances they have to have. And they go like twice a year. It's like a big production. So. This is a good example of when you're looking at autosomal recessive. Okay, so with each pregnancy, you've got both parents, they're both a care, they both have to be carriers. And with each pregnancy, there is a 25% chance or a one in four chance that the child will be affected with CF. Okay, there's a 50% chance that the child will be a carrier of CF, that they're unaffected with the disease and there's a 25 or a 1 in 4 chance that the child will not carry the disease and be unaffected. Okay. That's with each pregnancy. So CF pretty much affects every system in the body. Let's start with the lungs. So we've got that thick, sticky mucus. It builds up. It sits there in the lungs. With anything that sits in the lungs, we talked about stasis and bacteria growing and all that kind of stuff, so they're at very high risk for infection. They, these kids will have uh, MRSA, pseudomonas, all kinds of fun things in there.
sometimes they've had aspergillus, things like that. You don't want CF kids to cross-contaminate each other, so they, they generally do wear masks when they are outside of their room. These kids are on contact isolation. But when, they come, when you go in the room, when they come out of the room, they need to wear a mask, and they don't really need to be within three feet of another child with CF. That causes a big problem, because if I can't be within three feet of somebody with CF, how am I supposed to share an experience and issues? There's not really support groups for children. There's not camps for children with CF, because we're not going to put them all together and let them cross contaminate each other. So a lot of times these kids are involved in many normal activities, Boy Scouts, you know, Cub Scouts, things like that. Um, with other kids, you just have to worry about acute illnesses on top of that. So they're at risk for infection. So a lot of times these kids are on prophylactic antibiotics on top of any other antibiotics they may receive specific to a type of infection they carry. With that, because they have decreased absorption, when we talk about intestinal malabsorption and all of those things, their antibiotic doses have to be very high for them to actually absorb what they need. So a lot of times they have a much higher dose um, and if you looked at like a max daily dose, there's probably a max dose for CF too on the frequent meds you give. So they'd be one if you had a kid with CF and you're like, gosh, this dose looks high, that you'd want to double check that um, with the pharmacy that this is probably their actual dose. So how do we get rid of that thick, sticky mucus? They actually put them um, and do chest physiotherapy with the babies. They may have the little rubber cup on the stick and feed them, you feed the babies, or they'll cup their back and beat their back. Um, they may have the vibrating, but what works best on all of them is the vest that goes all the way around because it squeezes and it vibrates the whole chest at the same time. Yep. Mm -hmm. They have to. They can't get it up their own. They can cough and cough and cough and cough, and they will not be productive. It just sticks in their lungs. So they have to have chest physiotherapy. They actually have nebulizers. They get um, they get bronchodilators. Then they get a respiratory enzyme. Holmozyme, P U L M O Z Y M E. That's one y'all just learned. Um, but it is a respiratory enzyme, and it helps break up that mucus as well. Okay, so they're going to give them the bronchodilator while they're in the vest. They're going to give them the pulmozyme as well, and it's going to help break up and bring up that stuff. They have to do this like twice a day in the morning and at night. You want to make sure your kid does not eat before you do this because they're going to throw it up. Would, you know when you all have a cold and your whole nose and everything's stuffed up and you're gunky, do you feel like eating? Okay, these kids feel like this all the time. Okay, so they'll have those types of nebs. Um, because of this long-term cystic fibrosis is actually a COPD. It's a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So you can kind of compare that to the emphysema and stuff that you see in these older adults. With the COPD, you've got that impaired oxygenation. Long term, depending on the severity of it and how it's managed, you may see clubbing of their fingers and their toes. Some kids um, don't have it as bad as others, but if they're really poorly managed, a lot of times you'll see pretty severe finger and toe clubbing. Uh, they'll get that barrel chest, and you are going to have to give them oxygen to at least keep them in the low 90s. That's a hard thing to keep on them as well. They don't want to wear a mask when they don't want their oxygen. Um, these kids can be very persnickety um, and picky, and part of that is loss of control. They've got a chronic disease. They have no control over it. You have to be very considerate of those types of things when you're working with these kids in the hospital setting. Um, with that st thick, sticky mucus, it also blocks, like we talked about, their pancreas. And their pancreatic enzymes don't work, so it doesn't break up things like it's supposed to. So they have those fatty stools because all of their fats and the things that they need are being excreted. So they actually have to take enzymes for that, pancreatic enzymes like pancreolipase, with every meal. There's only a few things that you don't have to take it with, like some fruit juices and things like that. Um, they have to take more if they're eating especially fatty meals. So if they're having a bunch of chow down on pizza, they're going to have to take more pancreatic to help break that down. Um, with pancreatic enzymes, you have to make sure that they're given, most of the time they're like um, 
capsules that are filled with the little sprinkles. Um, and those can either be emptied into like applesauce or something kind of acidic to take it with. You don't mix it with milk. You can't heat it up. You can't put it in anything hot. It won't work. Um, with babies and things like that, they have special formulas that have it in there already. We had a five-year-old one time, and she was trying to open hers and dump it on her hamburger. And the student's like, no, across the room, and you're singing, cling, cling, cling. Um, so we used to be on the stand floor for several hours. So that was very interesting in looking at control and developmentally appropriate, you know, dealing with these things. Um, as we talked about with the pancreas, um, the fibrous scar tissue builds up, and they can get CF-related diabetes. So some of these kids will be on insulin and things as well, or constant carb diet to deal with that. Um, with the intestinal malabsorption, so anytime a kid comes in with what we call failure to thrive, and they're not growing well, and they don't seem to be eating well, and they're not gaining weight, and they just kind of look sickly, or they don't, something's not right, they will work them up for cardiac abnormalities, they'll work them up for respiratory, they'll work them up for celiac, and cystic fibrosis is one of the things they will work them up for, because it is a malabsorption disorder. Um, what that means is they have trouble absorbing the vitamins A, D, E, and K, which are the fat-soluble vitamins. So they actually take vitamins. A lot of times it's called ADEX or it's something like that. Um, these kids need one and a half to two times the calories of a normal person of that age. Um, these are the kids that you want to go through McDonald's and eat the double cheeseburger. Okay, they just won't. Um, they're very small for their age. But yeah, you definitely want to, which is very hard to get in these kids. If they're always junky like that, and we already discussed, we don't feel like eating or drinking or anything, and then you're trying to double feed them what they normally would. So a lot of times these kids end up with a gastrostomy tube, like a Mickey button, and they have to have formula feedings as well at night or things like that. We talked about their growth retardation. Um, speaking of growth retardation, anytime we have to give steroids and asthma CF or anything else, we want to be very wary of having to give it long term. So they do not give it unless they absolutely have to because it does cause growth retardation. Many of them have reproductive problems, so that's thick, sticky mucus blocks um, the cervix, it blocks the vas deferens, many males are sterile, um, and females have uh, problems with infertility as well. With the, we were talking about the sweat electrolytes and the loss of electrolytes, the biggest problem is with this is they lose a lot, they lose a lot of salt, a lot of sodium chloride in their sweat puts them at a big risk for dehydration and fluid electrolyte imbalance. So if you've got these kids out on the beach or out at Six Flags and things like that, you really have to be replacing those fluid and electrolytes with them. And you also just want to make sure you're not um, overhydrating them, causing them to become hyponatremic. What happens with hyponatremia? Where does the fluid go? We talk about seizures, why? It goes, yeah. <laughs> Your brain, yes, it goes to your brain. It goes up, it goes. Okay. Um. <laughs> Causes cerebral swelling and things like that. You can have seizures, you can have death, coma, things like that. So you want to be wary of hyponatremia. Um, but then they may need salt supplements as well with this. So a lot of times with parents, they'll, they'll say their baby's skin tasted salty when they went to get them, things like that. Most of the time, CF is diagnosed uh, if they diagnose it by genetic screening. Um, at birth, they really don't diagnose this unless they have a meconium ileus, which means they don't pass that first stool after being born, that meconium. Um, so it backs up. And so you'll see sometimes with CF kids in their charts that they were diagnosed with CF with or without meconium ileus. They're generally diagnosed within the first couple years of life because they come back with frequent respiratory problems and things like that, and they'll go ahead and test them for um, failure to thrive with the malabsorption. Uh, we had a kid one time that was diagnosed not until he was eight, and she actually came in for rectal prolapse. 
which is one of the most common um, gastrointestinal meconium ileus is the earliest, um, but rectal prolapse is one of the most common GI issues with it, and it's because of those frequent fatty stools that she just kept coming in with respiratory problems or diagnosed with asthma. And it's just really kind of interesting to see it that way. What questions y'all have overall about CF? I know your head's spinning. Okay, so if we're talking about infants, they're in that trust versus mistake, mistrust stage for Erickson. So we wanna be very wary about separation from caregivers. Um, and their caregivers can't protect them like they want to for medical treatment. So they're caring for the parent as well as the child. When we're thinking about that, um, one of the things we can do is provide consistent caregivers, but obviously the toddlers, young children, babies, the parent's the best, right? We understand if the parent can't stay, and at that point we will try to be consistent, but we can't have the same person 24 seven, obviously. Um, so if the parent can stay, we're gonna, con you know, can't think of the word I'm trying to use, encourage them to stay if at all possible. Uh, for PSA, they're in sensory motor, so they want to explore their world. Um, that's kind of more that they experience that more painful experience with them most based on their stage. And we're restricting their movement and chalking them full of IVs and things like that, and they don't like that. So we've got Mason, he's six months old with cystic fibrosis. He's being admitted for the first time. While completing the admission questions, his mom tells you that even though he loves eating baby food, he's not been gaining weight lately. She's also noticed that lately his stools have been greasy with a stronger odor than usual. What do you think could be a possible cause of this? He's not absorbing fat, right? So what do we worry about pancreatic enzymes? So we'd be getting the right dose. Okay. Now y'all feel like I'm breathing, heavy breathing over here. Um, so maybe he's not getting the right dose. So do we need to give him like more formula as a pancreatic enzyme? Do we need to switch around what he's eating? Now that he's eating more baby foods, do we need to switch into adding pancreatic enzymes to that? Okay, his dose isn't necessarily right. And pancreatic enzymes, they will titrate, like I said, if they're eating something more fatty, but they will titrate him to have normal stools. That's what they base that off on. So then when we're looking at toddlers, their autonomy versus shame and doubt with Erickson and they're pre-operational for PSA. A lot of them, because of that magical thinking and things like that, it's, it's I did something to cause this, so I was bad, it's a punishment to be in the hospital, that kind of thing. Uh, their language skills may not be developed enough to allow them to verbally express, I'm upset, I'm stressed, I'm these types of things, so they may lash out. So Sophie is a three-year-old with CF. While hospitalized, you notice that her parents don't discipline her bad behavior. They're also not very helpful when she refuses to take her enzymes with meals. What do you think could be a possible cause of this and what long-term effects could this have on Sophie? They feel guilty. Yeah, definitely. Guilt is definitely the cause, probably. Um, if you've got a child with a chronic illness and one that which is a you know, deteriorating condition and there's no cure for, you feel guilty. I mean, and you don't, if you punish them, you feel more guilty sometimes. So it's, sometimes you have to work with those parents and empower them to deal with that because they also need to realize that their child's life expectancy is going to decrease if they're not able to manage her care and be compliant with it. Um, long term, it can cause more uh, issues within her GI motility and things like that. She can end up with a, like we talked about, rectal prolapse, other problems like that. Um, growth can be retarded further if she's not absorbing what she needs with the pancreatic enzyme. Breaking it down. So preschoolers, we've got initiative versus guilt for Erickson and pre-operational thought. Um, egocentric, they can think they caused the illness, things need to be explained to them, but they need to be very simple. I need you to do this now, or I need you to do this. We can't give them like three-step things, that doesn't work. Um, we want to involve them in care, you know, that kind of thing. Can you hold this for me? Can you, when we're talking about CF and asthma and they're using the um, mask versus the pipe, some of the school age kids like to hold the mouthpiece and breathe in and out. It gives them a little more control versus the mask. 
So Jackson's a five-year-old CF patient admitted for a pulmonary tune-up. What are some of the ways we can safely involve him in his care while hospitalized? Just pulmonary management. You'll hear that a lot with respiratory. They're coming in for a tune-up. Basically, they're coming in to watch them. They may give them prophylactic antibiotics. Um, they're going to do a lot of respiratory treatments and care and that. They're just monitoring them every until it's kind of like tune up, like you come in for your oral train. <laughs> it's kind of what they come in. They come in and they do a lot of CPP and try to break up that and get them really good and cleaned out. Sometimes they'll just come in as a regular checkup about four times a year or they may have some other respiratory problem. Mm -hmm. Can he put together a nebulizer? He could put together the pieces. It's like putting blocks together. Do I necessarily want to hand him the rest seal of meds and let him try to pour it in? No, because he's probably going to squirt you in the eye with it. But he can do that. Can I put meds in a syringe and let him shoot them in his mouth? Yes. Okay. You can give him an extra syringe. And here, you want to give it to your teddy bear? You know, um, why don't you give your meds to you? Or do you want to have the medication first? You want your teddy bear to have it. You know, you can do all kinds of um, things that give him choices and control and Like you said, we can work with this age as well when they start getting in that school age well with sticker charts and behavioral charts. I've had kids fight over meds. I had a student fight a kid over meds. The kid hid it under his leg, and she's like, you have to take it. And he's like, no, and they're pulling on the cup and pills are flying. Um, I've had one refuse to take his Miralax, which Miralax is gross. No one wants to take Miralax. And when you mix Miralax, if you ever have them, let it sit there for any length of time, it becomes sludge. Okay? It's nasty. Um, but he didn't want to take his Miralax, and they were arguing, 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 and I'm like, well, what if we give you a sticker? He's like, how much do I have to drink? Because he had a sticker chart, and if he didn't get stickers, he got the Xbox or whatever he was playing with from Child Life taken away, and if he got stickers, he got to play a different game. So sometimes it's just like we said, a matter of positive reinforcement or bribery um, with kids. Um, but that's a good thing with them. Okay, so school age. That's that whole industry versus inferiority. Um, you have to find something that they're good at and that they can achieve, you know, be achieving, or they will feel inferior. Um, most school-age kids like to go to school. They like to learn. They like to find out what's going on. It's very hard with this that they have to miss a lot of school for three months illnesses, and then they can feel like they, they're the sick kid and they're seen differently. Um, they're concrete operational, so you can use a little more depth in what you're talking to them about. These kids, school-age kids with chronic illnesses, like especially like CF, very smart. These kids can tell you all kinds of things that, that are going on. We've had students go in there, and they're picking up their IV and their syringe pump, and they're like, oh, don't do it that way. Take this, do this, and do this. And I'm like, give them a chance. Leave them alone. Um, but they are. They will tell you a lot about their disease and their management. They know a lot about what's going on, and we want to encourage that because we want to encourage them to move through those stages and be able to help manage that as an adult. So Piper's a 10-year-old patient with CF. She's been coming into the hospital for years and is usually happy and chatty with the nurses. This visit, you notice she's more withdrawn, but she says she's okay. When her mom takes a break, you ask her if there's anything that she'd like to talk to you about, and she replies that the other kids at school are making fun of her for having CF, and she doesn't want to go back. Why wouldn't she tell her mom that? She doesn't want to make her mom feel bad. So a lot of times these kids feel like they're in kind of a reverse, kind of codependent, you know, very much with these chronic illnesses role with parents. So what are some of the ways that the healthcare team could try to assist with this? Counseling, okay. Um, depending on the age of the kid, counseling, play therapy, different things like that. She's a little old for play therapy. So definitely counseling. These kids should all be seeing some type of counselor. Um, we need to have good relationships in the community. We need to have good relationships with our other nurses. And so she could reach out to the school nurse and try to see what, you know, this could be the hospital nurse, this could be the office nurse, you know, if they're PCP, things like that, and see what, what's available. Is there some activity that she can get involved in that would help with that industry component of drug and development? Is this a class where you can go and do a presentation on CF or talk about things like that? And they're not sick, you know, you can't catch what they have, and you know, those kinds of things, okay? 
And if that's really a problem, they want to encourage that. You want that interaction. Are there some other things she can do on top of being homeschooled? You know, is there some other things, like different things like that? Um, so like I said, we want kids to grow and develop and interact. So that's the big point with that. Um, same thing with, like, the spina bifida, why we do bowel and bladder training, because we're not going to put a 10-year-old in a diaper at school and not change them all day because who wants to play with the kid that has accidents? You're going to work with them and try to manage their bowel and bladder training around them. So adolescence. So then you've got that whole identity versus role confusion um, because it's not going to happen to them and they all want to look different, but they all want to look like their friend, you know, all that. So it's a very um, bothersome to them to feel like they look different from their peers. They're already going to be smaller in stature. They may be more underdeveloped or underweight, um, but it matters a lot more than it did as a school-age child. If they have sports, if they have D-buttons and things like that, that's going to be concerning to them. They start to think about their future, and as they do that, they may become depressed. A lot of these kids are placed on antidepressants. Um, so it's like I said, they may need to see a counselor as well. And they just don't want their identity to include CS. They see this a lot with diabetes as well or with asthma. You know, I don't want to have to deal with this, so I'm just not going to take my meds, and I'm going to pretend I don't have it, which you know means they're going to come see you more frequently. Um, and then with formal operations as far as PSA. So we really want to support them if they're assuming responsibility for their own care. A lot of chronic illness clinics have nurses that work with these older kids and have like an adolescent care team. And I know like at Scottish Rites, the Spina Bifida and the Wing Center Scholars, they actually work with these kids and they have several weekends in a row where they come in and they talk about their future and planning for their future and how to call the doctor and how to reorder your meds and you know, different types of things like that. Um, so you want to encourage playing with other people. You want to encourage safe choices because a lot of times these kids will become reckless with those types of behaviors. And um, because we said, too, living in the 30s in the sky, early 20s, you want them to be involved in their care decisions. And a lot of times these kids want to be involved in including their end of life decisions, which could include some more training and things like that. So, you know, more of an advanced setting like that may be needed, but that's good for them and helps support anticipatory grieving. Um, Trey's a 17-year-old CF patient and a senior of high school. He wants to go to college out of state, but his parents are nervous that he won't be compliant with his care. What are some suggestions you could give the family to help Trey transition to being the one responsible for his own care? Okay, so are there resources? Is there a doctor? Is there a, you know, care team there you can help transition that care to? Is there a a, you know, how, like a dorm, you know, dorm or a group that you can set them up with to look at. Um, maybe they need to try the local junior college first and let them either live from home or live in an apartment closer to them maybe in case there's a problem there. And if that works well, then go off. Um, allow him to show his responsibility. I think really do that by making sure his meds are refilled and his appointments are scheduled and things like that. So what questions do y'all have? Are you brain fried? Okay, what I have posted, by 11, these slides will be up. 